What's wrong with uh, John Moyer? You know, John, I think they're. Uh, I can't think of another artist at your level of uh, of success that I've known longer in this industry. We go way back to uh, your days in Soak back in San Antonio, and, and and maybe the converse is true there. I mean, do you know many radio dudes longer than you know me? I think it's you, and then of course. Your good friend Kevin Vargas. Okay, yeah, yeah, and in El Paso, your former hometown. That's right. That's right. It is so interesting that that you know my old band Stoke. Obviously, you and I met when you were working in San Antonio. Yeah, and that's you were working with Kevin there. Yeah, and now years later, you know you're you're still in the business. You're working uh, in Nevada, and yeah, and. Kevin now is in my old hometown of El Paso, which is just crazy. <laughs> it is pretty nuts, man. And it just just for the record, just for future notes, so you know, it's Nevada. Anybody who's uh, who, who's from east of the Rockies tends to call it Nevada. All my relatives growing up in Texas, my uncle uh, used to call it, oh, I love Nevada all the time. And now living out here and being a Nevada resident for almost 20 damn years now, if you say, Nev- if you say Nevada, people out here in Nevada give you the big middle finger. <laughs> I got it. I stand corrected. Well, it is still called Reno, though, right? Not Reno? <laughs> it's still called Reno. <laughs> okay, just making sure I at least got that part right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, brother, let's go way back, man. Um, how did, you know, growing up and, uh, you know, graduating from Coronado, same place where my wife graduated, by the way. I think you knew that. Uh, yep. in, El, in El Paso. And then moving to Austin, how did that kind of shape you from a musician standpoint? Because Austin, Texas is such a musical kind of melting pot of different styles. Right. Well, going back to El Paso, I, I don't know if you know this, but my graduating class had members of At the Drive-In, Sparta, and um, uh, Mars Volta. Yeah, impressive all, players. All in the same. Yeah. So I think most of my uh, musical, you know, roots and, and where I come from really comes from El Paso, Texas. Yeah. When I when I moved to Austin. Uh, there was. It is a melting pot. There's reggae bands here. There's country bands. There's rock bands. There's metal bands. But there's not like any kind of one scene. So, you know, once I got into my band Soak, we would play San Antonio more than other places, more than Austin. We would play Dallas. We would mm-hmm. play Houston. Austin sort of just became the place to be from, but it not necessarily was like a big influence as far as my career or, or my playing style because I just sort of gravitated toward the heavy metal and hard rock scenes, which weren't super prevalent in the Austin area. Right. Now, moving forward, when you were in the Union Underground, uh, out of San Antonio, Texas, Austin at that point in time was, and it's still, you know, it's still a hip place to say you're from, but at that point in time, with uh, South by Southwest growing leaps and bounds every single year, was there any pressure in the Union Underground to to come out and say that you guys were an Austin, Texas-based band, or was the label and management and everybody else cool with saying, ah, we're from San Antonio? Nope, that was never an issue. You know, like like I said, Austin seems to be like the place that you're supposed to be from. Right. But, you know, being honest about, you know, where your roots are, and Union Underground in particular, they always embraced being from San Antonio. And not just from San Antonio, but being from, like, the outskirts of San Antonio. Yeah. So that was never an issue, you know. Um, I've been in one of those, I've been a musician who's been in bands from everywhere. Right. You know, my first band, Soak, was from Austin. My second band, Union Underground, was from San Antonio. And then when I joined Disturbed, they're a Chicago band. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like I have a bunch of little adopted cities. <laughs> yeah. It's all over the place. No doubt. You know, there was so much hype and so much build, and that, uh, you know, and, and Education and Rebellion was such a dynamite album with the Union Underground. How traumatizing, or, or how, uh, what, was, what were you thinking? in your mind when that project went south and everybody decided to call it quits in the Union Underground? Did it, did, or were you looking at, man, what am I going to do for a day job now? Well, it, being a musician, you know, in the industry, it can be very heartbreaking. Nothing lasts forever. Yeah. And so many bands are here today, gone later today. And even bands that are together five, six, seven years, you know, they break up and and it's like a marriage. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why you see a lot of musicians with chips on their shoulders because their band broke up and they can never seem to get back on the horse. That was never really an issue for me. You know, whenever one band broke up, 
I was always looking to the next horizon, looking to what can I do next? Right. Because I accept the fact that that happens. Um, but yeah, sometimes, you know, it can really affect musicians when their band breaks up and they, and they have a hard, hard time getting over it. Uh, for me, you know, getting a day job or, or doing whatever I had to do to make ends meet was just part of the deal until I could get back on stage again, until I can get back on tour again. Yeah. And, you know, fortunately, it, it wasn't long after Union Underground that I ended up getting the Disturbed gig. I believe Union Underground's last gig was October of 2003, and I ended up joining Disturbed in April of 2004. Did that feel like winning the lottery when they called you to tell you that you got the place? <laughs> Pretty much, man. Uh, <laughs> at that time... Disturbed was already two records deep. They yeah. had finished uh, the first album, The Sickness, the second album, Believe. Um, and after Fuzz's departure, you know, they were looking for a new basis, but they had already established themselves as a monster band on yeah. the scene. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, joining them was just, it was already like joining a juggernaut, only two records in. And then my first record with them was 10,000 Fists. And, you know, it just, played on records with them since then yeah i mean uh yeah just a, a great situation to jump into and you know you're really playing with consummate pros i mean all all the guys in disturbed have been had had been doing other stuff and other projects and you know they, they were they were seasoned vets you know unlike some of the uh you know maybe some of the other startups as a as a young musician you had probably been working with you know speaking of playing with different musicians dude you played with mike portnoy in adrenaline mob how nuts was that playing with a drummer that is that intense as Mike Portnoy. Was that a great experience for you, or was it a difficult one, a challenging one? It was definitely a change. You know, before playing with Adrenaline Mob, I had played with um, bands that were very regimented. Mm -hmm. Union Underground and Disturbed had always played the songs to a T. Yeah. You know, in Disturbed, we play the songs exactly as they are recorded. We deliver it the same way every night, and that's part of the challenge and the the way we like to do it. In Adrenaline Mob, it was more like a jam. Huh. We played the songs differently every night. Um, there was no click track. Sometimes the singer would call out an audible, and next thing I know, I'd be in the middle of a bass solo. <laughs> or we'd be breaking it down. Or, you know, and Mike played it differently every night. Yeah. So the first year with them was a, definitely a challenge for me to, to, to start to loosen up my own playing style. But it was great because... I got back to jamming again. I got back to being loose and in the groove and in the moment. Yeah. And playing with that band definitely made me a better player. I can imagine. You know, the, the, with Guns N' Roses getting back together. By the way, we're talking to John Moyer from uh, Disturbed right now. He's he's the uh, the dreadlocked bass monster. Um, there, there's been a lot of talk um, since the passing of Scott and with the Guns N' Roses getting back together and Slash having a solo album. What a cluster F Velvet Revolver was. Now, you played with uh, Wyland a bit in Art of Anarchy. Uh, was that I did. I, I, I played on his last record. The what? last record he did was... I was, I was lucky enough to... To, uh, to work with him on, on his last record with Art of Anarchy. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to tour any of it, but uh, it, was a, it was a good record, and, and I'm very proud of how it turned out. Yeah, was he just a... Uh, I, I, idiot savant is probably the wrong word, but um, what, what kind of guy was Scott Weiland to work with and to collaborate with? Well, I honestly didn't get to know him that well. Uh, the music was put together... And we just sent it to Scott, and yeah. he would send back the ideas to us. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of direct collaboration with him. Um, but what he did was genius. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's uh, definitely missed. Um, and then uh, filling in for Rudy Sarzo, who arguably is, is one, one of the, the best rock bassists on the planet, uh, working with Jeff Tate, who was just here a couple of weeks ago with uh, his Operation Mindcrime group. How cool was that, working with a guy with that kind of a vocal range? Yeah, that was a very interesting experience. Um, I had met Rudy Sarzo at a thing called Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp in Vegas. Yeah. And uh, Rudy and I became friends. And then when he needed a fill-in, he called me to do it. I, you know, was just blown away. Actually, actually, here's how it really worked. He gave Jeff my number but didn't tell me. Wow. So I ended up getting a call from Jeff Tate directly and a voicemail that said, Hi, John, this is uh, Jeff Tate from Queenstrike. <laughs> Just kind of wanted to know if you were going to be available in May to do some shows. I was like, what? 
So uh, I filled in for some shows with Jeff, and then eventually, the, you know, uh, the Queensryche, you know, name went to the other four guys, and Jeff ended up taking on the moniker of his new band, Operation Mindcrime. And I became a member of that band for a while. I played on um, his last three Mindcrime records, and I did a couple tours with them, and it was a great time. I really enjoyed the time with them. I'm still very good friends with Jeff. That's cool. Let's uh, all right. So let's move on to uh, to disturb the sound of silence. Uh, arguably, the biggest song in the in the career of Disturb so far um, was was that when you guys decided to do a Simon and Garfunkel song. Um, was that something that uh, you had a little trepidation with going into, and did it did it do what you guys had expected it to do, or was it kind of like ah, here's just a little treat for the fans? Well, Disturbs had a lot of of great success with covers, and you know I don't know if you recall the very first record, The Sickness. We had our cover of Shout, yep, uh, which people loved, and then later on, um, when I was when I joined the band on Ten Thousand Fists. Uh, we did a cover of Land of Confusion, which was another very successful song for us. So, you know, we kind of had a method. We, we would take, like, these songs that, that you would not consider to be rock songs or metal songs, and we would turn them into, you know, these these Disturbed-esque tunes, you know, with, with the classic Disturbed groove and, you know, with David doing his thing over it. The process on Sound of Silence was completely the opposite. Um, you know... Mike Wengren, the drummer, was the one who wanted to start the conversation about doing the Simon and Garfunkel song. Yeah. And as they, as you know, as uh, the band went through the catalog, you know, Sound of Silence kind of rose to the top. And of course, the initial idea was to put it through, you know, the Disturbed. You know, let's metal it up, let's rock it out. And Dan said, "No, let's not. Let's go in the opposite direction." Huh. And it's kind of like, well, how do you? It's already kind of an acoustic thing. What are we going to do with it? And it was uncharted territory for everybody. Um, and everyone just jumped into it and developed it. And, you know, with the help of, of producer Kevin Churko, you know, the band created something truly amazing with that song. And, you know, it's even more amazing to think that, you know, arguably probably the biggest hit before that for the band was Down With The Sickness. As, you know, that's regarded as one of the, you know, biggest heavy metal songs of all time. And then you're talking about a band, you know, six records later, putting out what you just mentioned yourself, probably their biggest hit to date. Yeah. That's, that's a big feat for, for any band to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and go, you know, Disturb's never been afraid to take chances. And that has, that has done well for them over the years. You know, just when you think you got them figured out, they change gears. They move in a different direction. And, you know, not everyone's always happy with change, but that change... Uh, is what keeps this band going. And, you know, let's, for lack of a better word, Evolution, which is the name of this next record that's coming out, is this continuing process for us. We're embracing this change that Sound of Silence sort of uh, gave to us, and we're moving forward with it. And you're going to hear a lot of those textures on this new record. Okay. The album is called Evolution, available October the 19th. Uh, Are You Ready? The first single we've been jamming here is our featured rock of the week for the last week. Um, congratulations oh, thank you very on, much. on that. Um, and you guys did something unique with regard to making this the first single. You kind of left it up to the fans. Tell me about that. Well, you know, it was just one of those things where we there's two sides to the record. You know, there's, there's, there's songs like Are You Ready, which are you know, the, the, the disturbed songs that our fans love to hear. You know, they, they want to hear those crushing guitars, those bombastic drums. They want to hear David, you know, just jamming away with his, with his very unique attack on the vocals. And then there's this other side of the record, which people are now falling in love with, this new voice of David that you hear on Sound of Silence. And fans want to hear that voice too. Yeah. So for us, it was like, well, which step forward do we, do we take and the idea was, let's just leave it up to the fans and, and see what they want. And we pretty much felt that they were going to go for the heavy thing at first. Of you know, course, especially yeah. our core fan base is going to want that. And, you know, that's the way it went down. But you'll see the follow-up singles, and as this record progresses and as this record comes out, there's going to be a lot of surprises and a lot of changes. And I think, um, I think it's going to be 
for a lot of, you know, we definitely have a lot of this record that's going to give the fans what they've expected to hear from us over the years. But, you know, unlike some bands who tend to just stick to their, you know, stick to their sound, we're progressing, we're evolving, we're, we're pushing boundaries for ourselves as musicians. But, you know, I think our fan base is going to appreciate that and they're going to embrace it. What is the uh, treat on this record? Do you guys have a cover song on uh, on Evolution? No, you know, um, that's always a question every record. You know, do we do a cover? Do we not do a cover? With the success of Sound of Silence, um, I think we felt that doing another cover just would feel like we're reaching. Yeah, you, know, you don't we're want to be typecast. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, we don't need to do that now. You know, let's let this record be all original. You know, granted, Sound of Silence was a wonderful song for us. It was a hit. But at the end of the day, it's not our song. You know, it was written by someone else initially. So for us, as we, you know, once again, I use the term evolution, as we evolve, we wanted to make sure that that, that evolution came from within. Right. And so right. there are no cover songs on this record. Very cool. I know there's a show in Austin, Texas on October the 13th. I'm, uh, I'm assuming this is kind of a warm-up show, or is this going to be uh, the, the full kind of tour experience of what you guys are going to be taking out on the road with, uh, I don't know, pyrotechnics? I'm sure you got a, a, a whole new evolved stage set up and everything else. What can somebody expect if they want to take a long road trip that, who knows, maybe I will come down for the uh, Saturday night, October the 13th show in Austin? Oh, I'd love to see you. Um, you know, it's not a disturbed show without pyrotechnics, brother. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, of course, that's going to be involved. You know, we did three shows this summer. And, and um, we what we did was we basically took what was happening previously with our last tour and, you know, just kind of ran off of that. Um, so it's going to be a lot of what we did the last tour, but with some of the new material. I don't think our new stage show is going to be in a full effect until um, 2019, the beginning of 2019. Okay. We're going to need, we're going to need a few months to put it all together. Um, because of the scope of the new record, there's a lot of changes that we now have to do within how the show flows, how we want to showcase it, how we want to expand on Sound of Silence. So our goal now is to lift our live show to a level that we've never done an unprecedented level for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and there's some bands out there that have done so such amazing live shows, you know, like a band like U2, yeah. um, that, you know, where they go through changes and, and the Foo Fighters where they really change up the way, you know, like sometimes they're on stage, sometimes they're out front, you know, they change locations where they play from. So these are things that, you know, we're going to take into account on a new tour. Um, but for the show coming up at ACL, you know, we don't have the longest slot in the world, so, you know, it's, it's a festival show, so right. it's not like, you know, we can do a two-hour headlining thing. And, so, and so John's talking about Austin be, City Limits, by the way, the music festival. That, that's right. right. That's right. We're playing Austin City Limits. I think we actually play October 14th. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the website. What, it says October the 13th, what, whatever the case. Oh, no, I'm, I'm being told. I'm being, I'm being actually corrected right now. It is October 13th. Okay. Right. Okay, cool. Cool. <laughs> My girlfriend just looked at me. She's like, October 13th. I'm like, oh, okay, yes. <laughs> Good thing she's here. I would have shown up on the wrong day. <laughs> John Moyer from Disturbed, man. Uh, I, it's, I, I don't know that you have ever played here in Reno uh, as a member of Disturbed. I know Disturbed played a really small uh, bar and grill called the Little Waldorf Saloon way, way, way back when. But I'm not sure that uh, the Disturbed has made another appearance here in Reno. And hopefully 2019 will be the year that we, uh, that we actually get a Disturbed show here in Reno, and if not, we'll have to drive over the pass to Sacramento, but sure would love to see you back here in, uh, in my new hometown, man. Absolutely. I love nothing more than to play there again. You know, this, this next tour, um, we, we're going to do a concentrated effort to, you know, hit as a, as a touring entity. When you do the festivals, you're kind of stuck playing wherever the festivals are located. Yeah. This next album cycle, you're going to see us come to more cities uh, than we have in the past. We're not just playing the big markets. We're going to try to hit every nook and cranny we can. Okay. 
And not not that Reno's a nook and cranny, by the way. <laughs> right, no, I hear you, man. I hear you. I, it's it's difficult. I try to explain it to folks who say, "How come they never play in Reno? They play in Sacramento." And I say, "Well, it's the economics of it. You know, uh, it's uh, these shows are awfully expensive to produce and put on. And uh, if you have a market that has you know five times as many people in it, you're kind of hedging your bet there on uh, trying to sell ten thousand seats and make it a profitable venture. So, dude, <laughs> you know, dude, it's the same thing here in Texas. You know, yeah." San Antonio has such a powerful metal scene, and it's only you know an hour and a half away from Austin. That to play Austin to one third, you know, the draw when we could just play an hour and a half down the road, and people from Austin will make the trip. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's like, well, geez, it's just so much easier to play Austin <laughs> or right. San Antonio. Right. Well, brother, I love you, man, and I appreciate uh, you always uh, being there. You're, you've always been very, very hospitable, uh, John, and, and we go way back, man. So, again, I appreciate the call today, dude. Congratulations on everything. Thank you, too. Love you, too, Jay. Thanks for having me on today. And, and once again, you know, new record comes out October 19th, yep. Evolution. Thank you guys so much for playing the single. Are you ready? And, uh, you know, we will all continue to go upward and through the fog. All right. We'll see you on the road, brother. All right, thank you.